Chapter 64. You are now listening to the Chapter of the Architect with DJ Architect. What's going on, my people in the place to be once again? This is your homeboy, DJ Architect. Welcome, you guys, to another chapter of the Architect, Chapter 64, with a good friend of mine, Marine Corps First Sergeant Mike Marshall. Mike, how you doing, brother? Ooh, freaking raw. What's going on, brother? First Sergeant in the place to be, man. How you doing? How's the family? Hey, family's good. I'm good. Retired. Uh, just living the dream. That's awesome. So, listen, I've been warning. I know, I, first of all, thank you for your time. I've been trying to get you here in the studio for a while Never. now. Uh, but, you know, you, you're, you know, you're busy with your family. Right, and, right. You know, so the dates wouldn't, you know, hit on spot, on target, like we say. But you're here, so thank you for your time. Uh, the reason why I wanted to get you in the studio is because you have a lot of interesting stories. Right, right. A man of your experience being a first sergeant in the Marine Corps, drill instructor, have several deployments out in the sandbox, That's and right. you've seen That's some right. things. Right, so right, right. I made it a mental note a while back to try to get you in the studio so we can record these things so they try can to talk about it. Yeah, right, so they right. could be, you know, they could be encased in the internet forever. Right. Mike, go ahead and tell us about your childhood and what eventually made you want to join the Marine Corps. Join the Marines. Well, you know, it's, um, so I'm born in New York City. Hoorah. Because I know you're from New York. That's right. Uh, from the hood, from Harlem. Born in Harlem Hospital. Oh, snap. Uh, it, you know, starts off right away because my mom was a teenager. Uh, she's 16 years old. All of a sudden, she's got this this baby. So life starts off rough for her, and you know, uh, I, you know, I look at her now, and because I was pretty critical of her uh, growing up, but looking back on it, I can't imagine being 16 and all of a sudden having this baby. So uh, you know, I grew up in New York. Uh, my my grandmother comes to help out, you know, because my mom has to work. But uh, my my biggest problem, first, first of all, being in New York, you know, everything's constant, everything's fast. Uh, didn't have that male role model. So uh, a lot of the guidance that I, most boys get, you know, they get from their dad or their uncles, I didn't have that. Mm. And, I, and I know I didn't have it. It wasn't that I was a bad kid, but uh, uh, I had no direction as a teenager. Um, I love sports. And, I, and in fact, the only reason I did well in school, because you couldn't play football or run track if you had below a 2.0. And the only reason I, I went to class, because I wanted to do sports. Oh, okay. uh, so, uh, you know, I went to high school, did sports, but I, I never thought past high school, Carlos. I never thought, um, well, do I want to be a doctor, lawyer, all that kind of good stuff. I just wanted to just to get out of high school. So high school's done. Uh, I remember graduating, and then that summer, my mom says, okay, you, you got to work. You got to do something. So I, I went and applied for the post office, and I... And I uh, started working at the post office. Post office in the 70s. I don't know. You've seen those mailbags? Yeah. Oh, my God. I uh, Let me ask you something. Yeah. And I don't mean to interrupt, yeah. but yeah. a lot of individuals. Now, when you were working at the post office, right. was it on uh, like some kind of temporary status? Or it was. You, it okay. Was. And then because uh, after that, you have to wait a while until you actually become Absolutely. a federal employee. Absolutely. But legitimately... You know, even now, people nowadays look at that. As, at, at those, I remember when I was back in New York, right. we looked at those jobs as, wow, man, you want to get in there. You're with right. the federal, you're right. working with the federal government, right. you, you know, good benefits. Right. But you were looking at it as, man, this is, you know, this is hard work. It was, you know what? And, and, you know, as a, as a teenager growing up in your parents' house, you don't realize what work is until you're out there. That you have to do it yourself. Okay, I, I moved out, got me a little studio apartment. I didn't have any idea how much things cost, how much food cost. Mm. Uh, you remember Subway? Subway back then wasn't that expensive, but mm. you had to pay for it every day going both ways. So I got my little apartment in the Bronx, uh, and now I got to pay rent. I got to buy myself, and it's just me. I was working my butt off, and I was still barely making it. 
uh, it took me a long time to buy a little black and white TV. <laughs> I had one couch, and the couch was a couch bed. And that was my furniture. I had two plates and some forks mm. and knives. But I'm like, and the work was hard, and the job wasn't guaranteed. Right. Uh, one, and, I'm, and I'm looking at guys that had been there for a while. There's a couple of these old guys that a lot older than me. And I'm like, that's going to be me 10 that's years from now. That's going to be me. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And they were not making that much more than I was oh. making. And then I'm like, you know what? Uh, this, this, I, I need to do something better. It's not a lot to look forward to. To this day, there's one guy. Uh, he was um, Panamanian. He had a thick accent. He says, you need to go and uh, talk to, uh, to a military recruiter. I'm like, you know, and this is, Vietnam is still going on when I joined the Marine Corps. And I'm like, and you hear all these things about Vietnam and people getting killed. What uh, year was this when you joined the Marine uh, Corps? 74. Wow. Viet Vietnam was over in 75. Wow. And on the news every night, uh, they would talk about so many VC killed, so many American soldiers killed. And that was kind of, like... Uh, people wouldn't put up with it today. Uh, 20 Americans killed. Uh, I always had 100 VC. Wow. I mean, and that was the regular news. And, they were uh, giving out numbers, man. Right, right now, people don't want to hear that. No, no. Yeah, uh, way too, too much people information. People get killed now. And that's way too much information. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I remember um, uh, the protests going on, too. So we're talking uh, all the anti-war movements going on. We're talking uh, civil rights. So there's a lot going on. Uh, and I'm like, the military, I don't know. So uh, I used to pass this recruiter office on the way to work every day. This gunnery sergeant, Carlos, high and tight, sharp ribbons. I had no idea what it meant. But right. It looked good. Right. Uh, he, he knew my name. He said, hey, Mike, how you doing? Never once, come on, Mike, let's talk about the Marine Corps or anything else. First of all, I never thought about Navy, Army, any other service. I had friends that had joined the marines and they come back and they were different human beings huh. uh, they it changed them right uh but um so my my co-worker approached me he says you know mike you know this is you in 10 years if you don't change something and he says you know you'll be good you're an athlete you'll be good in the, in the military i'm like okay um so i talked to i found out late he was a gunnery sergeant i had no idea what it meant i went and talked to him he says, well, what do you want to do? He said, I just want you on the Marines. I had no idea you can ask for a job, Carlos. Specific, you yeah. know, military. Infantry or right. something. I just like, I just want you on the Marines. <laughs> and you know what? He didn't push it either way. He's like, mm. well, okay, just go down here, take this test, the ASVAB test. Yes, sir. And uh, I passed it. Not once, I found out later, I, I had a opportunity to do a lot of jobs, but he never talked about that. Oh. And, and, he said, and this is during the summer. This is like... Um, now we're talking July, July or August time frame. And he says, Mike, okay, you passed the test. Uh, you can be a Marine anytime you want to be. You and know, I, I was going to say it sounds like a good recruiter, but that's not a good recruiter. No, good no. Recruiter, a good recruiter would have gave me some you, options. Look, based yeah. on your ASVAB score, this is the selection yeah, of jobs that you absolutely. have. What do you, what do you want to do? What, what do you, you want to do? What do you think you'd be good at? Right. Mike? But, you know, uh, God uh, was looking after me, Carlos, uh, because if anything had been different, my whole life would have been different. Uh, I, I went back in there the, uh, the end of July, uh, early August, and said, yeah, and, and the work, and I was, just, I was just fed up. Oh, I know what the, the tipping point was. Went home to the Bronx when I must have left my door open. That TV that I worked months to get, oh, gone. Carlos, wow. Carlos. Uh, they took all my little silverware. They took all my clothes. In fact, whoever took my, my uh, items swept my apartment they cleaned my house and swept all the dirt in the middle of the road and they left the broom in the dustpan oh, i am wow. like okay i'm done the, I'm aud the audacity, <laughs> the audacity. <laughs> at least they could have trashed a place but they cleaned my place for oh, me oh my, my god wow. uh, the next day i talked to the gunny gunny said when you want to leave i said i want to leave asap uh i talked to him carlos on a wednesday i was on a plane that saturday going to Paris Island. And, you know, back in those days, there's no computers. I can't research. I have no idea what to expect. Uh, so, uh, I, did, I, did, re did the recruiter attempt to give you yeah, an yeah. idea of what to expect? No, not at all. What was your first impression of boot camp when you got there? Okay, so I get on there. You know, I'm from New York, Carlos. <laughs> 
<laughs> I get on the plane with a bunch of other yahoos, and uh, we, you know, we all, hey, you know, we join in the Marines, you're all motivated, uh, and you fly down to Charleston. You mm-hmm. remember this, Charleston, South Carolina. So yeah, I get off the plane, and there's somebody there in uniform to meet us. He gets us in a group. Eventually, we get on this bus. And, uh, and, you know, the bus, you're in the city. Charleston's a major city. You're driving the bus, and you're just kind of going down the road. All of a sudden, you know, you get from the city, and then it's the, <laughs> there's a house every 100 yards. Then there's a house every five miles. I'm like, where the – and I had heard, you know, Paris Island. I had, I had no idea what it was. I, ne- I didn't know about swamps in Paris. Mm-hmm. out in the middle of nowhere. Carlos – Driving for a while, there's nothing. There's no lights. It's two o'clock in the morning, but we're you know that's the bus is full. We're all wide awake, like you know what's going on. Finally, the bus pulls up uh, at this gate, and you see the MPs, you know, waving mm-hmm. the bus through. Yep. But you still not where you're going. If you remember Paris, absolutely. Island. You know the funny thing is, Mike, when when I was going to Paris Island, right, right. you know, it's funny how they they make that timeline when you arrive around 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but yeah. when we were in the back of the bus, a lot of us from, uh, two of us from New York, a right, right. couple of us from New Jersey, one or two from New Jersey, right. we were in the back of the bus rowdy. Ah, yeah, bah! <laughs> but once you hit those gates, oh, it was everybody oh. was quiet. Butts pucker, bro. Quiet yeah. and, and nervous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you can feel it. Yes. And you know, and you, you're looking at, I was like midway through, I'm looking at the bus driver. I swear he was smiling because he knows. He knows. <laughs> Can I curse Carlos a little Absolutely. bit? Absolutely. Shit's yeah. going to hit the fan. <laughs> he knows. So he's driving along. You're a black, heavy set guy. And um, we pull in front of this building. And it's just this one light's on. They got a new complex down there now. But this, back in my day, it was these old buildings, old white buildings. And uh, I he, remember those. Yeah. Within and a lot he of men- pulls up. Yeah, a lot of administration. Yeah. You know, it wasn't receiving. It wasn't, no. But no. a lot of administrative paperwork was done in those right. buildings when I went through. Bus driver gets off, and he didn't say, get down, get up. He just kind of left us there. He yeah. got off the bus, and we're sitting there like, like what the hell? And it's qu- Paris Island, man. <laughs> <laughs> it is quiet. I mean, there's not even crickets. Mm-hmm. And um, I swear, Carlos, maybe about 15 minutes later, Shit hit the fan. All of a sudden, these five drill instructors came out of the building. And uh, one of them, huge black guy, jump on the bus. If you're swallowing gum, you better freaking swallow it. You get, when I say get off, and like yellow footprints, it's like, you have no idea what he's talking about. Like, what the right. F yeah, is a yellow talking, footprint? Right. He's talking so fast. Yeah. Yeah, his his voice is is loud and boisterous. Yeah, and so you're trying to understand what he's what saying. Part, and basically, what you're doing is following the person it's in right front in of front you. In front of you. Get the fuck out of the And you know, trying to find yellow footprints, trying to get your gear. Mm-hmm. And I dropped that, and it's like okay. And then he's, and I tell you to move. You know, the whole drill instructor lingo. I want you to go inside. You sit down. I don't want you looking. Get your eyes off of me. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, you know, meanwhile, we ain't pissed in like two hours. That's right. Yeah. And so everyone's, everyone, I know everyone, because I am like like dying to piss. <laughs> but uh, so we get inside and we're sitting on the floor. Back in those days, they had tables. They would walk on the tables. So all you can see is their feet, but you couldn't look up. Right. And uh, one y'all who's, hey, hey, uh, hey, mister, I think he said mister. Can we uh, use the bathroom? <laughs> oh my God, Carlo! <laughs> Ten people attacked him. <laughs> bathroom, ah! and I, and I'm like, I, I'm just going to piss on myself. I ain't, <laughs> I am not asking anybody anything. Eventually, we got through that night. Um, uh, you know, um, I think we, Carlo. I swear, we went to bed like maybe four an hour later. The lights were on. Yeah, yeah, like. What get up? And you're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> we just got here. Yeah. So, uh, and and you start thinking, Carlos, we ain't even been there a couple hours. There's people already crying. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, like that's the way it was. Oh my god. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, oh, you crying? You want to go home? And and just say, and this and they were just looking for the weak ones. My whole goal was, I'm not gonna say anything. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna show any emotions. I'm just gonna sit. I'm gonna be part of that wall. That's right. And just sit here and just kind of like you know, it's not that hard yet. Yeah. Um, next morning gets us up an hour uh, later you know haircut uniforms 
bam, bam, bam. And it's, things are happening quick. Mm-hmm. Before I realized it, we had been there maybe a day, day and a half, and we finally get to meet our drone. No, in fact, we don't meet our drone instructors. That's the day they give you your sea bags, you got all your gear. All your gear. Mm-hmm. And uh, they march you. Get outside, get in line, you know, formation. Carlos, they marched us for like two hours. I found out later after I'd been there for like, maybe not even two hours, hour and a half. After that, you know, because I, I was a squad lead, so I got mm-hmm. to walk around there. The receiving buildings was right across the street <laughs> from the squad bay where we were. So it always dawned on me, why does it take so long? Why does it take? <laughs> <laughs> they must have took us out to the rifle range and back. <laughs> I am, because I remember carrying sea bags. We had these, um, they call them chrome domes back mm. in those days. Do you, you remember chrome domes? I, I know of them. We didn't okay. have them. Though. Okay. It's the metal, the metal. Uh, yeah. Helmet. Happy helmet. Yeah. yeah. Shiny. Keep, keep your head <laughs> cool or something. Guys, if you saw a full metal jacket, that that's the chrome dome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we and, and you're just and you're in line, tight it up there, and it's yelling and it's sweating. And I'm like, man, this whoever we're going must be out in, in the boonies. Turns out later it's right across the street. So we went to the squad bay, they set us down with our gear, and then they left. Yeah. And then that's when we met our drill instructors. Mike, <clears throat> what in your opinion, what was the most difficult part of boot camp? The beginning, and you have to get used. You have to get used to the routine, the language, uh, because it's it's a different language. Calls. Right. It's uh, head calls, decks, overheads, hatches. Uh, yes, sir. No, sir. Uh, there is no I. No. This no. recruit. Yeah. Right. Uh, drill instructor. Uh, senior right. drill instructor. Right. Yeah. Uh, you do, your whole verbiage and the way you communicate and you have to changes. learn that quick. Otherwise, you're going to pay. And you have to memorize it. Like, right. it, guys, it's it's like sometimes it's a, it's like a paragraph that you have to memorize. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and if you get one word wrong, you, everybody gets thrashed. Right. right. Uh, and you, you know, Carlos, and then once you figure out the routine... Human nature, you figure out what works for you. Uh, we were never getting enough time to use the bathroom in the morning. We are never getting enough time to shave. You're never given enough time to get dressed. To eat. To eat. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. So, uh, you know, after about, maybe oh, for me, like uh, three weeks, I would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, get with the fire watch, fire watch the security, mm-hmm. walk in the head, sit, you know, get me a nice long toilet break, <laughs> brush my teeth, <laughs> shave. Right. I would get... Everything prepared. I would, I would get dressed except for my boots. See, Mike, you were extremely smart. I was too. <laughs> no. I was too tired <laughs> to, to be getting up to, to get up. You know, early in the morning. But what we did start to learn is like at the halfway point, the senior drill instructor was like, "Hey, dummies, well, how about you get up 10, 15 minutes early?" Put your camis on and make yeah, pretend yeah. you're asleep. Yeah. And we, it dawned on us, oh, man, this guy's giving us tips and He's tricks. He's helping you out. He's right. You know, you because out. we yeah. were just like a bunch of sheep. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> the thing that boot camp did for me, Carlos, in one word, and it's uh, my uh, scene, Jones, talk, I look back, he had to be maybe 24, 25. His name was uh, Hunt. He ended up becoming a sergeant major. He came back as the depot sergeant major when I was a gunny. And you didn't realize these guys must have had 20 uniforms. But it's Paris Island. It is 90 degrees. Ooh, it is humid. The humidity. This guy's uniform was immaculate. Yes. We would go PT, come back. He would already be dry. And I saw him out there PT mm-hmm. with us doing push-ups. Dried off uniform. Back in those days, the mm-hmm. satin, starch oh, uniforms. Yeah. I am like, how? H- how? Yeah. And I knew that's what I wanted to be. Mm. I didn't want to be anything else in the Marine Corps. I didn't want to be recon. I didn't want to be a tanker. I didn't want to be an officer. Carlos. You want uh, to be a drill instructor? I want to be a drill instructor. Now, <clears throat> after Paris Island, what was your first duty station? Uh, I went to, I came out here to California. I had never left New York. So I came to California. They, they, it's SOI. Back in those days, they called it ITS, Infantry Training School. Came out here. Hump the hills, and uh, it was. I'm like, I thought I was done with boot camp. <laughs> school, it, it was now it's called school of infantry, yeah, uh-huh. school of infantry, and it, it was stress all over again. But uh, I, I did well in boot camp, uh, ended up becoming squad lead. I got meritorious PFC. I came out here, nice, to congratulations, S- SOI. I, I killed SOI because I'm now, now, and because it's, it's been the athlete 
and being in the Marine Corps kind of works hand in hand. That's right. And my goal was not to talk. I, I wasn't going to complain. I was just going to be the first. I was never going to be last in mm. anything. And the thing I can say after like 25 years in the Marine Corps, I had never dropped out of any runs. There you go. No humps, no nothing. That there was, you go. If I wasn't first, I was close to the front. There you go. So uh, I end up uh, out of SOI. I became a meritorious Lance Corporal. Hey. And the thing is, the recruiter, you know, some people are promised all that stuff. I did uh, so I'm meritorious. I was number three in my class. Look at that. So you I, and I have so many comp. And yeah. I, was, I was a meritorious Lance Corporal. Guys, meritorious <laughs> means that you were promoted because you, uh, you, you your peers or more your your the people that are in charge of you saw how you excelled and performed. And they decided that you were the best of the group that they had. And you went up against other private first classes. And then maybe there was three or four on that board where you would battle it out. You would go in front of maybe three or four right, staff right. sergeants, gunnery sergeants, and they would ask you knowledge questions. They look at your bearing. They look at your uniform. They make you do facing movements to make sure your uniform was squared away. And uh, it was nerve wracking. But oh my God. if you yeah. were able to pull it off, pull it, off right. it gave you a total new level of what is the word tact and right. bearing in a new way of handling stress right. uh, because those are aside from combat those are one of the most in my opinion stressful situations where i was in Absolutely. so I, I yeah i was a a pfc and i i picked a meritorious lance corporal and check this out mike mm -hmm. four months later i picked a meritorious corporal six months for, me. for you? Oh, look yeah. at that. <laughs> so you beat me. You beat me. But, uh, you know, uh, the thing about the Marine Corps, unlike the other services, like Navy, they take tests. Or yes. the Army, they, you know. Right. The Marine Corps is your peers. Mm -hmm. And it's your, the people your, you work with your, every day. Yes, yeah. your leadership. So, right. you know, everyone, I, I thank you for saying that. Right. You know, because you could have a book smart, like individuals in the Navy, they take a test. You could be book smart, be able to retain knowledge. But if you're at asshole or right. a, uh, no a person, leadership no yeah. leadership a right. person that backstabs guess what you'll get promoted right in the marine corps for a meritorious promotion anyways right you know the, the, you got to get the thumbs up from the people within your platoon right to say you know right. this is the person right. that we because want. they ask those guys you yeah. know what what is carlos what's say carlos is always helping mm -hmm. other marines out he's he's always like because the leadership don't see you right. in the dog days when things are going bad that's right so, uh, so Carlos, I, I picked up Meritorious Lance Corporal, and I'm infantry. I'm thinking I'm getting ready to go to 1st Marine Division, 2nd Marine Division. Uh, I end up lucking out and going to what they call Marine Detachment in Norfolk. Had no idea about Marine Detachment or anything. So I, I go to Norfolk, Virginia. And Norfolk, Virginia is a place, is a, a little uh, area. It's, it's called Sinclair Fleet. And what that, what that is, is... Um, Commander in chief of the Atlantic Fleet. You have Saint Saint Clant, Saint Pack Fleet. You know, commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet and uh, commander in chief of the Atlantic Fleet. So I, I go to work in Saint Clant Fleet. Uh, I didn't know this at the time. There was a guy named Jeremiah Denton. He became governor of, uh, I think, Alabama or Mississippi, one of those southern states. But he had been a prisoner of war with John McCain. Wow. Uh, he was an admiral. He was at Hanoi Hilton. Doing That's the prison 70, camp, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. doing Vietnam. Now he's a, a command in chief of the Atlantic Fleet. Uh, at the time, he was a three-star admiral. When I was there, he picked up four stars. And there was another guy under him named Admiral Kidd, which is another story. But Jeremiah Denton was a prisoner of war. Now he ran this, he ran something called the um, Staff Academy, which all officers have to go through when they pick up, I think, captain or colonel. And he ran St. Client Fleet. I became his driver. I'm Lance Corporal Marshall. I, I go interview in front of a lieutenant commander. Says, and they called them orderlies back in those days. I, my job was just wherever the admiral wants, at, I, I'm the guy. At that time, did you realize the importance of that position? I, I had. I'm, I'm learning it on the fly. Right. The thing they never. The orderlies have to drive. Carlos, I'm from New York. Oh wow! I had never drove a car. That's right. I you had, were up and down on the subway. I was on the subway. <laughs> I was on the bus, uh, trying to look fly in my <laughs> in my cold weather gear. But um, it's funny. The Marine Corps. No, how do you have a driver's license? How long you drive? So I went for the interview. Got the job as orderly. Uh, I had a buddy of mine who was a corporal. Says, "Uh, 
hey, you're going to love that job. You get to drive a Plymouth Fury. It has lights and grills. I'm like, hey, um, I don't know how to drive. I'm from New York. <laughs> he took me out the same day. We went to Norfolk, Virginia, DMV, looked through the booklet. I took a driving test right there. Wow. Got my driver's license and became an orderly. Took Get the command in chief. out of here. How scary is that, though? Absolutely. You got a guy driving the, you, the head guy <laughs> of the Navy. And you just got your driver's and license. And I just got my driver's license. Hey, man, well, kudos to you yeah. for, for knowing what you yeah. had to do. Yeah. And jumping through the hoops. Yeah. So I, uh, Admiral, uh, about like six months later, said, how long you been a last corporal? I'm like, sir, I've, I've been the Marine Corps six months. Well, how long is it between E3 and E4? You know, sir, I, I really don't know. I never looked into it. Well, I think you need to be a corporal. I'm like, sir, I, I believe I do. <laughs> <laughs> he called my major, who's in charge of the detachment, said, I want to make uh, Lance Corporal Marshall a corporal. Major's not going to argue. Right. That next day, I was a corporal wow, marshal. Wow, look at I, that. I'm like, what? Look at that. Uh, That's Carlos, awesome. 12 months later, uh, uh, maybe 14 months later, I'm a sergeant. Wow. Uh, I'm, I'm, clo I'm closing in. Uh, back in those days, you did two year stateside, two year overseas. Then you were done in the Marine Corps if you weren't going to reenlist. So now I'm getting, I'm a sergeant now. I'm getting close to going to Okinawa. I had never been in charge of anything. I, I'm an orderly. I'm not in charge of troops or anything. I uh, go to Ninth Marines in Okinawa. <sighs> go over there. All of a sudden, I'm the section leader for an 81 millimeter mortar platoon. Wow. Uh, so where were you stationed at in Okinawa? Uh, Camp Swab. Okay, I was at Hanson. Hanson, yeah. Hanson. We used to go to Hanson because that's a uh, Kinville. Yes, sir. Kville. Yeah, yeah I'm, what, can we say buddy, that over me, yes, what we me, did in Kville? Me and my buddy <laughs> considered ourselves Kinvillian. <laughs> we, we spent so much Knew time all out the there. Club. And then we went down to uh, Kadena. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the Air Force the, base. the Air Force Base, they yes. had the best chow hall. Oh, so we yes. used to do that trip on the weekends. Mm -hmm. But uh, up at Swap, it was a Hinoko. I did a little dive bar, but it was anything to get off base. Mm -hmm. The thing about Swab, though, unlike Hanson, we were at, we were at the beachfront. Nice. So uh, nice. we used to go out snorkeling. I, I love, I, a lot of people didn't like The, the Rock. Mm -hmm. Had a great time at The Rock. I loved it. I was there oh. for two years. I was supposed to be there for one year. Okay. But you extended? <clears throat> yeah, it was, I, I, because I was. Listen, I got real lucky. I, I, I got to do cold weather training in, uh, in Mount Fuji. Okay, same. And uh, then they sent me to South Korea for the 50th anniversary of the Incheon landing. Wow. So we had this huge ceremony with wow. the Rock Marines, and it, it was beautiful. We were, we were in our dress blues. Right, right, right. Uh, nonetheless, I fell in love with South Korea. So I extended with the intentions of going back to South right, Korea. It never right. happened. I got to go to Camp Fuji, which is mainland Japan, ladies and gentlemen, right. once again. But you know what? I, I wouldn't trade that for anything. I, I loved it. But the thing about Okinawa, uh, I still had in the back of my mind, Carlos, I'm a sergeant now. I was just going to check the block overseas. But all I wanted to do is be a drone instructor. I was going to lean list to be a drone instructor. I knew that when I went over there. But uh, I hold company march up Mount Fuji. I mean, the whole company mm -hmm. went up there, had these old men with sticks passing us by. Uh, uh, went to South Korea, to Pusan, trained with the Rock Marines who did mountain oh, yeah. training. Yeah. That's hardest, bad, some bad motherfuckers. Hardest military I've, I mean, I've ever witnessed to this day. Guys, yeah. Rock Marines are the Republic of Korea Marines. Right. right. Bad, bad, bad motherfuckers. Yeah. Wouldn't Much want respect. to mess with those those yeah, guys. Uh, and so we did training with those guys uh, in Pusan. We went by Seoul. Uh, the funny thing, we're going to South Korea. We went there in the wintertime. So we uh, leave Okinawa. It's 90 degrees. We got all this cold weather gear. But, you know, you got the sleeves rolled up. C-130 lands in Pusan. You can look out the bathroom aircraft, snow. Yeah. And you're like, people are dying trying to get this stuff on. <laughs> Carlos, I have never... I'm from New York. Mm. It gets cold in New York. Oh, yeah. It's not South Korea cold. Oh, no. Oh, my no. God. I've yeah. never been that cold in my life to this day. Uh, sea rats. We had cans. You had MRE. <laughs> I'm starving. I can't even get my hands to move <laughs> to open my can. Uh, of food, yeah, so it's it, just it, it was it, an experience. It takes away all your your oh uh, your hand eye coordination, oh, all that feet stuff. Feet numb, hands yeah. numb. So no. uh, I reenlist. I go to Paris Island. Now I'm a drill instructor. The thing about being a drill instructor, and I'm not sure how much time you got. It's just you get Marines from all over the Marine Corps to go down to Paris Island to be drill instructors. All MOS, dispersing, artillery, 
infantry, Amtrak's, and the thing about all of them, because in the infantry, I'm the fastest runner. I was running 16, 17 mile, uh, three, I was 300 PFT Ooh, all the time. Guys, that yeah. 16 minute, that's three miles. Right. <laughs> that's three miles, 16 minutes. That's not a mile and a half. Yeah. You go down to Paris Island, Carlos, that's nothing. Mm. You, you, I am mid-pack. Ooh. You know, when I was in ninth rings, I'm me and my lieutenant, the mm. first ones to finish. You go to Paris Island, you, you can't even see the people in front. There's people running 14, 15 Ooh. down in Paris Island. Wow. Doing push-ups forever. Oh. So it, it was kind of humbling for me a little mm. bit. I'm like, I thought, you know, I you thought, thought my you... shit didn't stink, <laughs> but you get to Paris Island. And then um, it's back, you're back in boot camp again because the instructors at DI school... Now, you know, you think your uniform is squared away, but it's not squared away. They, uh, they jack you up. And, yeah, because uh, you have to be impeccable. All the time. You have to be flawless. You are going right. to be creators of Marines. And that's, and that's the whole thing. You're yes. going to be making Marines. You, you're, you're responsible for the, the carrying on of the Marine tradition. So if you're jacked up, they're going to be jacked up. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, Paris Island. If it wasn't for me being a drone stock, I probably would have got out of the Marine Corps. And not that it was boring. I love combat. I love being in the field. But the the being a drone stock that gave me that polish that I didn't have. Being in the Marine Corps gave me the manhood. Being a drone stock that gave me all the other pieces I didn't have, like how to walk, how to talk, confidence. When I was a drone stock, that I was I'm five six. I always say five something, but I'm actually five six. <laughs> uh, I weighed a hundred. I weighed 155 pounds my whole adult life. Uh, so I am, I am this little guy in front of 90 human beings. I can get a platoon platoon of recruits dressed out of the rack, dressed, shit showered, and out the door in five minutes. That is power. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and I'm going to tell you, don't feel bad, Mike, yeah. because I'm 5'6", too. <laughs> and the funny thing is because I, when I first met you, I was like, look at this little guy. <laughs> and you and I are walking around like he owns the place. Yeah. And you and I are the same height. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and my insecurity, my mom says that's why I joined the Marine Corps, because mm. I was insecure about my You know, height. the funny thing yeah. is, I, and I will say this about short Marines, right? So there's a lot of the gunpowder in them. Oh man, there's People, a lot of you know what I mean. I don't, I don't know what it is, but uh, say, it's because we have to prove yeah. because we're so short. My, uh, my first song said, "You are a, a hurricane in a soda can." <laughs> <laughs> That's, I like day, that. I yeah. like that. She said, uh, so "You are hurricanes." I'm like, "What do you mean? You're like, you you got to be the loudest, <laughs> the most vocalist, explosive, explosive." Uh -huh. I'm like, "Yo, come on, first sergeant." Picked uh -huh. up stash sergeant. There you go. Uh, I end up extending on the drill field. Once you pick up stash sergeant, you become a black belt senior mm -hmm. drone instructor. That's all I want to do to be a senior. And I was I was happy. I'm like, I've been a drone instructor. I went back to the fleet. Uh, this time I went to Camp Lejeune. Uh, and that's where I get all my combat. When I was at Camp Lejeune, I was in the 8th Marines. Now, real quick, on October 23rd, 1983... What do you know about that date, Mr. Listen, Carlos? Listen, why you call me Staff Sergeant Lopez if you want? <laughs> you know what I mean? I got a little bit of knowledge in me. What do you know me. about that date? Listen, yeah. Yeah. cowardly, sucker-ass bombers attacked Marine Corps backs of the 1st Battalion, 8th Marines of the 2nd Division, Beirut, Lebanon, causing huge casualties for Marines and uh, soldiers as well as sailors. I also have to acknowledge the loss of French paratroopers from the second attack at the right. Jakar building several miles away. The last time the Marine Corps sustained such heavy losses in one day was back in the Battle of Iwo Jima back right. in World War II. Right. Tragic, tragic day. You were there. Right. Please tell us about that experience. Uh, now, the thing about uh, Beirut... Uh, I had been to Beirut. When I first went to 8th Marines after I left to Gerald Phil, uh, there was a guy named Yasser Arafat. I remember it, him, yeah. Israel had, uh, Yasser Arafat was in charge of the PLO, Palestinian, Palestinian. Liberation mm -hmm. uh, Organization. They were bombing Israel. Israel invaded Lebanon. And they had Yarafat and his whole crew pretty much encircled in Beirut. They sent the Marines there so they can get out without being massacred by the Israelis. So that was the first time I was in Beirut. And I forget what year that was. That must have been like in 81, 82. Because in 83, we're back in Beirut. 1-8 uh, was in the bombing. 2-8, which I belonged to, was there to relieve 1-8. Uh, uh, one one eight. Eight. Uh, so uh, as, we're, as we're arriving, as we're like pulling in, 
And, you know, uh, and you've been on deployments. It's not like you can pick up a newspaper and read what's going on. No. All we get is rumors that there had been an attack uh, on the headquarters building. I had been in that building my first tour. And the things about Marine infantry, they say always spread out. Never have a, 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 a cluster of Marines in one place because all you guys can die at one time. And what do they do? They put all the headquarters in the terminal building wow. at the airport. I mean, it's just... Totally Cluster against, fuck. right, totally yeah. against Marine philosophy. Purpose, right. right. So, uh, the kill, when we first got the word, we thought it was 50. Even 50 said, yeah, 50 Marines have just been killed at the embassy. Carlos, that every, was 200 plus Marines. Every, maybe 15, 20 minutes, it went from 50 to 60 to 70 to 100. And we're like, whoa. And we didn't realize it was just one bombing. We thought mm-hmm. they were getting attacked. So, uh, Finally, when we hit the shore, we got the word. We're part of the cleanup. Uh, then they sent my platoon and my lieutenant. I was a staff sergeant at the time up north uh, to a place called Corniche uh, where they had just blew up the embassy. Uh, Steve Keir, the, the coach of the Golden State Warriors, mm. his dad at that time was the president of the American University in Beirut. They walked into his office while we were there and executed him in his office. Wow. Steve Keir at the time must have been like, because we put his whole family on a helicopter. He must have been maybe like 13, 14. Wow. And I, I hear about Steve Keir later on because he went to University of Arizona. Yeah. I'm like, is that the same guys? So I looked him up. Yeah. And it turns out to sure be the enough. ambassador's son. Sure enough. And then he ended up Michael Jordan, you <laughs> Look know, at the that. rest of the history. So, Look at that. Uh, but um, we went there, uh, clean up. So I'm in two places. Uh, and Beirut at the time is scary. I, you know, I wasn't in Iraq or Af- Afghanistan, but you wake up, you're, you're in the middle of the night, you're out there, it's quiet, all of a sudden there's this huge explosion that just blows up the whole, the whole earth shakes. You have no idea where it's coming from. You don't know who's doing it. And you're just waiting for some truck to come down the street right. to, to blow your ass up. And uh, we were there, that happened in October. I think we left that spring, so maybe April. And, you know, uh, 2-8 leaves, I, I, get, I go back uh, to Camp Lejeune. Next thing I know, I'm up for orders. I go back to Paris Island. Uh, back to Paris Island, I pick up Gunny. I become a serious chief show instructor in charge of a whole series. I get selected to go to DI school. Now, do you still keep in contact with any of those individuals from the Beirut bombing? Uh, yeah, I am all on Facebook. Uh, we, I mean, and it's funny. Some of those guys have only did four years in the Marine Corps. Uh, Carlos, I'm not one of those Marines that wear the cap, uh-huh. the pins uh-huh. and all that. Neither am I. Yeah, I, I don't Neither have any stickers on my car. Yeah. You know, being the Marine and combat veterans here. Yeah, you, you, uh, you, I, I, I agree with you. I yeah. think the day will come when I'll grab all my citations. <laughs> and like, yeah. you, like what you have there, yeah. I have in there. It's yeah. like a, yeah. with what, all my awards. You know why I keep this at? In here. Yeah. 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 You know, maybe one day I'll be that guy right. where I'll, I'll wear the, right. you know, the, the cap. Right. But not now. I just, I, I don't know why. It, it's important to me. Yeah, it is. But it's not like, it's, it, it's not, it doesn't identify who I am. It's yeah. not everything. Yeah. You know. And, uh, and, and to me, yeah. it's, uh, I know what I did, right? Right. So right. if I put that out, it's for somebody else to know what I did. Right. Right. So I thought somebody asked me. Right. right. So I don't, right. I don't know. I, I don't want to be braggadocious. I, right. You, and I you don't know, know if and, that makes sense. And you got these guys that haven't did one, and not to downplay what people do, because uh, I was in Grenada, I was in Beirut, uh, um, I mean, I was in Somalia. Uh, I've been in these places, but you know, unless somebody asks about it, uh, it don't. It's just because my wife gets on me. She says. I didn't know you did that. Mike, we, we've been together. You Mike, know. we we need. I mean, I know we're we're gonna do what we can with right. this podcast, right? But we're gonna need you for a part two, all right? Because right. I had no idea that you were in Somalia or Grenada. Two eight. It was only second battalion, eighth marines in Grenada. Okay. Yeah. Then, and then there was the eighty second airborne on the other side of the island. Yeah. You know, it's it's wow. Tell us tell us about Grenada. What? So I know it was Operation Urgent Fury. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Uh, when uh, Grenada was. Uh, Certain things, um, you know, uh, um, we'll talk about, um, like Grenada. We go there. Grenada is like the first day. It's bah, 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 bah. They shot a helicopter down. A couple of people killed. 
uh, quick funny story in Grenada. We get off the helicopter. Could you, could you, uh, just for the people who are listening, mm-hmm. who, who, why were we there? Who won't know yet? Yeah, yeah, please uh, explain why the Marine Corps or the uh, American military went. Like, like the, um, like in Cuba when uh, Russians put missiles there, and Kennedy sent, uh, you know, say, listen. If you guys don't remove those missiles, we're going to invade Cuba. Same thing happened on Grenada. Uh, Cubans had placed anti-air weapons, uh, all kinds, and had also those students there, American students in in Grenada, had taken them and taken them hostage. So they sent. This story could also be told on Heartbreak Ridge with uh, Clint Eastwood, where they did invade that right. Grenada. So right. if you guys want to look, not to say that that's... Accurate. Yeah. Accurate, right. but we're talking to the man that was there. Go right. ahead, Mike. So um, they sent um, the Marines. Uh, we sent a whole... Uh, it wasn't MAU back then. It was a MAU, M-A-U, Marine Amphibious Unit there. So we talking air, land. And uh, uh, I was air at that time. They put Marine infantry in helicopters. You had the... Uh, Marines and Amtrak's, you got the Navy SEALs, and on the other side of the island, you got the 82nd jumping out of airplanes. So coordinated effort. I mean, we got in those helicopters at like 2 o'clock in the morning. Hey, you know what? That's a pretty impressive uh, it's it was, a spectrum of force. It was huge you got, at the time. You know, you got airborne, you've got Marines, and right. you've got Navy SEALs. Right. Woo, I right. wouldn't want to fuck right. with those. One day, Carlos. Oh, one day, whooping. done. The whole island secured. Uh, so the, we were there for like maybe two weeks. So we, maybe a week. Uh, the rest of the time, just secure, making sure. Uh, some quick stories. Uh, there's a couple of the locals that were co- coercing with the Cubans, and they were hiding the weapons. Uh, Carlos, we walk into this warehouse, and we're still looking for weapons. And they, they kept pointing to this guy, his name is Bully. And I'm thinking bully. It never dawned on me that he was a bully. That's what they call him. Ah. But uh, he had a warehouse, Carlos, a football field full of AK-47s in crates. Brand new. Brand new. And uh, we walked in there. And, you know, I'm a gun nut anyway. Me and my lieutenant looked at each other. Hmm. Like, still in packing grease. I'm like, does it fit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I carried that AK for like a week. Then they're like, you know, I don't want to go to jail. Thank you. I yeah. was going to say, you know, oh, there were a lot of Marines. Me and the Lieutenant. And, and like, when I was in Iraq, they got caught. And oh, they, they, we had they a couple were try- guys get caught. Yeah, they this. were trying to send them in, in parts. They would break down the AKs and they, they ended up getting we had caught. a Lance Corporal would take it apart and put it inside of a Hummer. And I'm not sure how they, they must have dogs or something or somebody snitched, but uh, they end up finding them. Went to the brig. Wow, you yeah. know, it's funny you say that. Uh, my first tour in Iraq, there was a corporal who was it was a shit bird, right, right, and he ended up getting my buddy in trouble because my buddy uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Ramirez was you know his his platoon leader. Uh, well, actually, it was sergeant at the time, the squad right. leader, and uh, right. he took the NVGs that was designated for the fire team, and he took apart his radio, the innards of the and radio, put the, and put the NVGs there, and 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 mailed the radio home. Got my buddy in trouble, but nonetheless, yeah, you, some real crazy shit Marines did. Did they ever catch him? No, they didn't have any evidence. You know, we kind of figured it out, but nobody. There was no f- right. you know evidence. But but you know, Carlos, uh, looking back on that, and I. I Carlos, we're talking AK-47s, as far as you can see. Mm. Uh, and it turns out later, the Admiral and the Captains, they all got, like, plaques for the AK-47s, but you as a Joe Blow Marine couldn't touch them. Yeah. Uh, it turns out our company gunny, who was, this was his last deployment, he's supposed to retire, had taken a crate of AKs, and he was selling them to the uh, sailors on the ship. Ain't that some bullshit. End up catching them, busting them down to private, put them in the brig. Ooh. And uh, there 20 goes, years, 20 years gone. There goes your retirement. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> now, Mike, I'm going to ask you a question where, right. you know, <clears throat> just to give the insight of before the fog of war. And l- ladies and gentlemen, the fog of war is when you're actually in combat and a lot of things you, you perceive, you look, you see, the dust, the sounds, it creates a confusion. Right. But there's another, there's another feeling, there's another thing that an individual goes through emotionally, mentally, right before the moment of combat. And that could be two weeks, or that could be two hours. Right. Can you explain to the individuals how what that feeling is when you're sitting there with your, your platoon right. or the battalion, and then you have 
the most senior person giving you guys that inspirational speech about you right. guys are about to go to war and then how do you deal with that in your own mental right it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't hit you it didn't hit me so you know i'm, I'm riding around somalia is the best example because i'm we loading into amtrak's the colonel had just got the whole and Marine Corps is the only person only group that i know that does this like a pep talk i mean we're out on the flight deck we're out in the middle of the ocean there's no lights and he's like you know, this is, you know, you can train, you can practice all your life for the Super Bowl and never play in the Super Bowl. You are lucky yes. to be doing this and representing here. So, you know, don't let yourself down. Don't let the Marine Corps down. Don't let the country down. And you're like, you know, you, let's go. You know, that's what, they, that's what they're doing. They're feeding your soul right. the dynamite that right. it needs in order for you to go out there and be right. as precisely destructive right. <laughs> as you possibly right. because they need you to You're be right. that way you, yeah. they need you to rush that fucking machine gun turret with three or four marines in, in a tactical maneuver yeah and you can't think about it you just gotta Call fuck us. it and that, that's a, that's a, that's the funny thing you don't i never thought about dying or i could die in this helicopter or this amtrak or, or somebody can you, first of all you're so tired you're, you're so Carlos, you know, before you realize you haven't slept in three days trying to get things done and you are worrying about the next little evolution, that it's, it's like days have gone by. You haven't, you eat when you can. Right. There's no like lunch break or right. go to dinner or, uh, okay, let's lay down, ladies, and go to sleep. It's like, <laughs> no you nap know, time. No, there's no you, nap. You mean, because cause even on downtime, yeah. okay, training, we got to train. Right, right. Did you, you know? clean your weapons? That's right. When's the last time you, you cleaned your what rifle? What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Get the fuck up. There's <laughs> always something to do. Something to do. And before yeah. you realize, days have gone by. Right. So, th th thinking about, like, something happening to you, it's like the last, that's, I'm not even, you're not even thinking that way. In fact, you're thinking, most Marines are thinking about their troops. You know, hey, does my boys have enough child or have enough water? Where are we going next? And um, the thing that uh, I, I think about most is that I don't really actually think about it or ponder on it until I'm out of it, until I'm back on the ship and I think about all the stuff we had done. And then it hits me like, you know, you know, you know, that's funny you say that mm -hmm. it, it, it hit me on two times right. when I was in um, Iraq, my first deployment. The first time was because when we went to Iraq, we were in commercial airplanes. Right. And as we were leaving, you know, we, we got our, you know, M-16s, M-203s, right? Walking on the and, 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 yeah. and as we're leaving, the stewardess are crying. So that was the first time it hit me. And I was like, what the hell? Like, I don't need to see that. I don't right, want to see right. that. Contain yourself. They were crying because you guys were okay and going home? No, because we were going into... Kuwait, oh, into okay. Iraq. We, okay. we had just landed into Kuwait, so you know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to feel any weakness. Sure, sure. Right. So I was, when I saw it, I was like, God damn it! And then when we were getting ready to to cross, ladies and gentlemen, it's called the LOD from right. Kuwait into Iraq, the line of departure. That's when you're about to go into combat. Uh, the staff NCO started passing out body bags, and yeah. I and when I saw that, that's that was the second time it hit right. me, and I was right. like, whoa. Right. And then you're right after you go through whatever skirmish or firefight right. you go through, it, it doesn't happen there at the moment, right? But because the adrenaline rush kicks in, and I mean, whatever fear you have, uh, you you just fall back to your basic level of training, right? And and that kicks in, and you operate. But when you're by yourself or it's quiet time and you start going through everything well, that, that just happened, happened. Right, all of a sudden right. you start feeling your heartbeat right, you start right, uh, beating right. a little bit quick right. like holy shit man right. I'm in Beirut uh, we know we're going to be leaving shortly uh, shortly maybe in a couple of weeks you know because they start the 3-8 uh, is on his way over and so they want us to start you know writing what we do uh, let our plans on where the defense positions are all that kind of stuff and uh we get resupplied. You know, Marine Corps teaches things, but then they don't practice what they... It, people get lazy. So, uh, you know, you're not supposed to put a group of Marines in one building, you know. That's right. Uh, the other thing is, you don't want to do a routine. Like, if you're going to resupply, don't resupply in every the same Sunday. Spot. Right. At the same spot. Right. Same time. Bigger than shit. Every Sunday, eight-ish, helicopter comes up to where we, our position. Drop some chow and take our mail and then go back to the ship every Sunday, Carlos, for like weeks. 
bigger than shit. I got this corporal, and I had just left the drill field, and he's like, you know, I want to pick up Sarge, and I want to be a drill instructor. And uh, he was a, a radio man. He, he didn't have to go to the, the resupply people of my working party. Go down there, pick the stuff up, bring it back, right? Uh, he begged me, you know, I, hey, you staff sergeant, I've been here all this time. I, I just need to get out. Can I go with the resupply? And uh, Gargano, um, I'm like, Copa Gargano, I, I don't need you, bro. He said, well, I just want to feel like I'm doing something. All I sit here to do is listen. No, he's a dragon gunner. That was mm-hmm. it. He was a dragon gunner. So I sent him on the freaking resupply. Bigger than shit. Uh, Sunday, nice, beautiful. Beirut's like Miami Beach. Mm. Beautiful, green water. Uh, I can see the helicopter coming. I'm, I'm about a mile down the road. All of a sudden, uh, Mercedes pulls up RPGs. Like, wow. phew, just shoot at the shot. The, you know, the guy in the helicopter, the pilots, you know, they did their little evasive the, the action. Uh-huh. And, uh, but just blew up at my working party. Boom, boom, wow. boom, boom. One person killed. The corporal. The corporal. You know, and I and it just oh. it, it, it hit me, bro. I'm like, he wouldn't even been there if it wasn't for you. If it wasn't yes. for me begging me to send him down there. So, how 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 you know? Because I could understand there sure. could there could be moments of you blaming yourself right, for right. his death. How did, how did you handle that? It, it was hard. Uh, I um, you know, we I escorted him back to the ship. Um, when we got home, uh, me and my couple of my platoon buddies, you know, I'm a staff sergeant, so I got, you know, a couple of sergeants, uh, and we end up um, going to his his house. He's from New York, upstate New York. Uh, and, you know, it's just uh, the Gargano family. I, I still have him on my Facebook. But it's just, um, you know, they, they and they don't, they said he would rather be anyplace else, you know, because you know how patriotic families are. Yes. You know, he was a Marine. Yes. They're proud of him. Uh, you know, uh, so it, they never looked at it's anyone's fault. Right. You know, it's just, you know, he was a Marine, and, and that's one that's, of those things that happen when you're a Marine. It right? happens. Right. But it, it, it kind of like, are you kidding me? The one the one guy, and they brought him back. My corpsman's like, and you can see, I'm like, Doc, you need to stop. Right. Yeah, you can right, see he's gone. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. So, but uh, it's just, and shit happens in combat. In college, you've been there like that. Yeah. One minute is... Sunday, you you BS and telling jokes, mama jokes, uh, and next thing you know, freaking shit and hitting the fan. Yeah, the the next moment, your your assholes trying to swallow your boxers, <laughs> and like, what the fuck just happened? Yeah. But I, I had a couple of moments like that, man. It's just it's just, and the Marine Corps for me. So uh, you see me now, Carlos. I am. Um, I will be seventy years old in three years. Mike, you look very Mike. physical. You are uh, a physical specimen for such at 70 years old. Come on. The Marine Corps did this. You know, the Marine Corps, I wasn't, I was a, a knucklehead, uh, power to the people, Malcolm X, you know, mm-hmm. you, you hit me, I'm going to hit you back, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, uh, I was, I was a angry black kid and the Marine Corps just say, listen, you know, uh, you can talk to talk or you can walk to walk, you know, people I put through the high school. Mm. One became Sergeant Major in the Marine Corps. What? <laughs> what? Could you could you explain to the people what the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps? Who we, what's that title entail? First of all, to be a Marine Sergeant Major uh, is the highest enlisted rank in the Marine Corps. You have the officer ranks, which goes from second lieutenant to general to commandant, and then you got enlisted so it goes from private nothing on your sleeve mm-hmm. to start major three up four down star in the middle and the equivalent is burst and bomb which is massive guns massive which guns. is also, also important mm-hmm. but uh and i used to tell my lieutenants you know what y'all can be commandants y'all can be you know in charge of units you can't be a drill instructor oh valid and he's like, valid. what does that mean? I'm like, you can be, I'm just telling you, you know, don't take it personal. Yeah. You can be the commandant of the Marine Corps. You can't be a senior have drill ever, instructor. Have you ever been a drill instructor? Right. 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 <laughs> it's like, you see this smoking, hey, Lieutenant, hey, you can't put this on. You, you, you know, another rank that to me is, is prestigious and almost like the white well in the Marine Corps right. is a gunner. Gunner. Mike, can you explain to the people real quick what a gunner is? So the, the burst and bomb. Right. You have the warrant officers, warrant officers, and... There's like a master gunnery sergeant. Those are experts in their field. They can be in EOD, which is a ex- explosive ordnance. Uh, they can be, I mean, gunners uh, are 
masters of their masters their of, of, of the weapon system. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I had this gunner at the rifle range. I'm a senior drone instructor, and this one recruit just can't get on target. And we're at the 500 yard lines. Marines have to qualify at the 500 yard line. Iron sights, ladies and gentlemen. No Iron sights, no Iron sights. Red dot, okay. nothing, man. For you dummies, that's that's <laughs> five football fields, all right? right. We got to hit black on target. Black on target. No scope. Gunner uh, Wayne Wright. I remember his name. He was legend at Paris Island. Took this recruit's weapon. No changes to his sight alignment. Nothing. In the offhand, shoots five bullseyes, throw the weapon back to the recruit. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was he was that guy. He didn't care about what his uniform looked like. He he was a master. He wore the you know you have your shooting badges. Yes, sir. But you had those guys that wear those special badges. Oh yeah. Oh, he had he had like a couple of those Ooh, like those gold badges. Wow, absolutely. I don't even yeah. know how you get those. Colors. Right, it was probably I mean, ten plus expert. <laughs> you know, I, I am listen. like. But uh, the gunner, when the the gunner actually has as much respect, if not more respect, than the general. I mean, because you no I, one no listen, one questions the gunner. I, man. I have the utmost respect for gunners. I've only met three in my whole entire right, Marine right, Corps career, and, and, and and that's that goes for Chief Warrant Officer Fives also. Right, right. They're far and few right. between. Now, First Sergeant, what would you say to a civilian? Wanting to become a Marine, and what would you say, and what recommendations would you give to a young Marine to succeed in the Marine Corps? Right. The, the uh, Marine Corps is not, you can't join, like, you always say these guys, I want to be a Navy SEAL. You know, that, that sounds good, and it's very, like, movie-like. Uh, same thing with me, I want to be a Marine. And first thing you ask them, it's like, uh, so, you know, do you play any sports? And you try to equate it to something that they realize, and you... You ever been on a team that has never won a game and you're like, I want to quit the team, you know? Um, Sometimes being in the Marine Corps is like that. You're going to get in a place where it is this, as Carlos, I was the first sergeant laying on the beach in White Beach, freezing my ass off, wet, we had just attacked, uh, I forget that island out there. And I'm sitting there watching I-5, the cars go down I-5, and I'm like, I am, I am 40-something years old. <laughs> <laughs> first on. I am soaking wet and there go Carlos Lopez in that car uh, with the heat on jamming why, why am I doing it here you always have those times in the Marine Corps and you're like uh, this is this is greater than that it, does right. that make sense That's this is right. this is greater than yeah, yeah I'm miserable and you know the funny thing Mike is when you when you leave the Corps those moments is all you brag about. You, you treasure. Yeah, you do. And like, dude, I went through the suck. I went through the suck, but you know what? I I was w- with my brothers. Yeah, yeah. So which which it, it made it. It was worth. It was it. okay. You you if and I love being around Marines. You're out there. It is twenty nine palms, and you're like, oh, this is fucked up. This is, and they bitch the whole time. It's fucked up. As soon as they get back to the rear, <laughs> yeah, we were out there. <laughs> We walked a hundred miles. It was in the heat. We didn't have no water. And you look at them it's like, wait a minute. Yeah. You were just whining. Bitching. You bitching. Now all of a sudden and it's but that's the Marine Corps. You know, uh that's it's, right. it you know, this sucks. This and if a Marine's not bitching, he's not happy. That's and, right. Uh, and I, and you don't want Marines to be happy. No. You want them to be bitching yeah. is that cause that, that gets them mad. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know? Uh I uh I uh it's funny. I can remember the Marine Corps like yesterday. I can't tell you what I did yesterday at home, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember I was in the, in boot camp in August 1974. Wow. Uh, I can tell you what's... I can go to that squad bay right now and show you the rack I slept in. Wow. Uh, I mean, uh, just... It's funny. I was a, a recruit in the same squad bay as I was a senior drill instructor. Oh, no way. I remember when I first got that platoon my uh as my first platoon as a senior drone like i was in the same squad bay at the in this at the, that i was as a recruit and it felt funny did you being take, there did you take a moment by yourself to go to your old i did rack? i went to my rack i would have i would have uh, done I the same to thing there's like a this. third rack down on port side <laughs> uh on starboard side and i i was on the bottom rack there and i, I remember that i remember and I, and it was just 
and it's just it, it was it was weird for me for like a second, you know. Like now, damn. now, what would you say to a young Marine wanting to succeed in Marine Corps? Marine Corps is, is hard, Carlos. It's, it's it's like being a Navy SEAL uh, or uh, being Delta Force, like you know, Patrice's uh, son was going for Ranger, and I think it's all. There's one common denominator to all of that is one, you cannot have any quit in you because you're not going to be the fastest, strongest. Uh, the, the difference is, is who quit and who stays. You, you can't stop. You can't stop. Yeah. Uh, on the runs, I, you've been on those runs in yeah. formation and you're like, I can't take another step. Yeah, uh, but, but, but you do. You do. Yeah. Carlos, you know how I, I used to judge him? Uh, I was a PT instructor at DI school. Uh, I used to tell them, okay, we're going to run five miles today. We're going to go and come back to the school. Uh, I would look at my, I was a gunny. I look at the first sergeant. He knew I don't want to stop at the school. I want to go past the school. Oh, yeah, because yeah. You, what you want to do is you want to break their spirit. I want to break them. Cause yeah. they, and I'm like, all right, and then I start. Because, they're, because they, once they see they the school. They got their mind made up. They think is, their school, done. this is the finish line. Right. The moment you go past the school, you break them. You break, you break their soul. And I want to see who those heart. people are. That's right. Call, as soon as we get to the DI school, and I'm like, we made it home. One mile. No, 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 no. And then, uh, okay, here we go again. Around <laughs> half the class will fall out. And uh, also the cadence. Yeah. The, the volume of the they cadence. They start getting loud. They, 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 going they, they, home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, going home. Yeah, but then when you go past it, it just dies. They're like. There's no volume. Like, again. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why me? <laughs> it's it is classic. It was classic. Half Carlos. Mm. This is like a, yeah, school like 50 students. Half, I swear, half of them would just drop. Like, okay, I'm done. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, and, those are, and I used to just, and then I used to thrash those guys. Right. You want to be a drone stalker. You, you give me all this. I want to do uh, That's all freaking talk. And I used to put them in a pit for like an hour. Good. And just trash them. Good. You Good. know, because Good. that's, you want to be a Marine, you got to think of the worst thing conditions. that could possibly happen. Yeah. Worst conditions. And you got to be okay. I'm okay with that because it's all it, it's all mental. Your blues and your parade. It's all mental. Man. It's all it's man. all mental. All and, and, and you know the thing about it is that goes for anything in life. Right. You could be in the most poisonous, toxic environment. Right. And still be able to handle it as long as you're okay mentally. Because once you quit here, yeah, well, you're goes. fucked. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You're right. Uh, Jeremiah didn't go into that admiral that I talked to. I. It's funny. He didn't. He didn't never talk to me. I. I end up reading his book. Mm. Uh, so he's in Hanoi Hilton with these other prisoners. You know, they never saw each other. The only way they communicated was Morse code. Back and Morse code, yeah. And uh, can you imagine being someplace for seven years in a cell? You're getting your ass beat, John McCain, and you have no idea when you're going to get out of there. I mean, and it's like, so when I hear people trashing military people like they did today, I don't want to get into politics. Huh. It's just, I'm like, as soon as you, military made me what I am today, you know, and, and when you, you can't talk about it. Only one can talk about the Marine Corps. Was the people the who served. That's right. Within the Marine Corps. Right. Yeah. Anyone that served, because I've gotten open-minded. Listen, yeah. Yeah, and we can't talk about politics, you know, but there was an idiot, he was in fucking charge right now, that said uh, he didn't care for McCain because he got caught. Right. That is the most stupidest thing that I've ever it, fucking it just, heard. And, and even after the man dies, he is still going after him. I am like... He, he, like you with your bone spurs, uh, you can't. If you are a Medal of Honor winner, okay, maybe you can say something. But you have never been in the military to talk about someone like that. Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah Denton was John McCain's commanding officer. I think John McCain was a uh, lieutenant. Jeremiah Denton was a lieutenant commander. Both flew A fours. You know, got shot down. Right. Uh, Jeremiah Denton couldn't stand up straight. Uh, I mean, he uh, just quick Jeremiah Denton story. You heard about this guy that the, the North Vietnamese made him go on TV to denounce the U.S.? That's right. He was doing Morse code with Morse, his eyes. That was Jeremiah Denton. That's oh, the guy I drove for. Right. Oh, get the yeah. fuck out of here. Yeah. Uh, and wow. I, he used to scare me, Carlos. I used to go to his house, his quarters uh, early. He wanted to be picked up like at 530, sun coming up. And, I, and I'm in the car. His, his wife used to give me donuts and cookies. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you just made me spit my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I go to the door. He is standing in the screen door. He used to wear 
uh, Navy has these white uniforms. And uh, I, I'm, I'm looking down, I'm, you know, going in, I'm getting ready to go in and get me some cookies. <laughs> uh, he's standing in the door. And he's, and he's just like, and he never looks at you. Mm. I mean, he would, you'd be talking to him, and he, he would talk to you, but he would never look at you. Right. And it was, it was just, and he's tall, but he was always humped over. Huh. And then I found out later, and they put him it, in the box. And, it was because you know, of he was, the, he was, the he was, injuries. He, injuries. Yeah. Just, but, uh, and he's sitting in the car. And, you know, I can't drive. I just got my driver's license. <laughs> Norfolk got all these You're railroad about to tracks. fuck this man up. <laughs> <laughs> I am driving. He's got a cup of coffee. They didn't have coffee bars back then. <laughs> I am like, you know what? They're going to put me in the Hanoi Hilton. <laughs> and I'm driving slow. And he's like, hey, hey Lance Cope, we got to get there on time. And I'm like. You know, do you want to spill coffee or do you want to get where you go? It was just, I, I have a million of those stories. Wow. Man. Well, we got to get, we definitely got to get you back here for Sergeant Mike Marshall. Ooh, Listen. Freaking raw. Peace <laughs> and the memories. It has been a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Chapter 64 with First Sergeant Mike Marshall. Hopefully, we'll get you back, brother. Once again, thank you so much for your time. DJ Architect.